Well, hello everybody and welcome to this podcast. My name is Daniel Otto and today I want to talk about why climate change negotiations fail. And um, I will have a special focus on analyzing that from international relations perspective. Therefore, my presentation is structured in three parts. First of all, I'm going to briefly tell you about the climate change negotiations and the conditions we have. Second, I'm going to explain the three main dominant conflicts we have in climate change negotiations so far. And then I'm going to apply the theories of international uh, relations to explain what we can expect considering the climate change negotiations in Paris this year. So, first we have the international climate change negotiations. They take place in the COP, which means the Conference of the Parties, since 1995. These are, these negotiations are mainly between, or only between the states. They are a total amount of 196 states, which yearly um, bargain in the COP. These big negotiations, which you see in TV, once a year with these big media events being uh, all over television and newspapers are accompanied by several low-level conference. So there are only technical uh, things, um, administrative things which are debated. Um, in the COP we have the pr principle of one state, one vote. So that means the principle of anonymity that makes the um, climate, change negotiation, the climate change negotiations very complicated. So we can only have an agreement if all states agree to, uh, for example, um, uh, an agreement, a protocol or something similar. During these climate change negotiations we have three big conference uh, conflicts um, which were dominant throughout um, the history of climate change. And the first conflict um, called the first division is within the developing countries. So this is mainly between um, the states on the one hand from the OSIS, which is um, a group of different low-lying uh, states. We have Brazil and we have South Africa. On the other hand we have the OPEC states, we have China and we have India. And um, they are debating mainly the question of who's in charge for climate change. So who has caused the problem and who should be responsible to solve it. And these groups of OSIS Brazil and South Africa mainly think that everybody is responsible for the climate change problem and the reductions uh, of emissions should apply to all countries. On the other hand, the OPEC states think that the causes are mainly responsible. So for example, the US, the European Union are responsible to solve the climate change problems and these causes only should take uh, emission reductions. So that is the first conflict. The second conflict um, we have is within the developed countries. So there's a main divide between the EU, which acted as a pusher for a long time in the climate change negotiations, and the US, long time acted as a laggard. And this division is mainly about the type of regime that should solve the climate change um, problem. So the EU on the one hand wants a legally binding uh, protocol, for example, um, we had this in Kyoto, where a legally binding protocol was signed uh, in 1997. They want a top-down approach, so that says that we have a um, reduction target on the international level and the states are uh, forced to take uh, reduction measures. This is mainly supported by the environmental community, um, which is active in many countries of the European Union. Um, on the other side, we have the, EU, uh, the US as a laggard, um, which is voting for voluntarily targets. So the states um, apply the targets um, themselves and they are not set up on the international level. So that means more a bottom-up approach um, that we had in the COP15 uh, in uh, Copenhagen, where there were kind of a pledge and review system. That means um, the states give the reduction targets themselves and um, provide them um, on the international level. Um, this is mainly supported by the business and um, the industry, which do not want to have um, any reduction um, targets. The third conflict um, we have is between developed and developing countries. 
And one could say that this is a dominic, uh, dominant conflict um, we have at the moment, and that will also be um, an important conflict in Paris this year. Um, this is between um, the G77, which is um, a union of um, developing countries, the OSIS, the basic states, um, including Brazil, um, South Africa, India and China. And on the other hand, we have um, the US and the UCANS group, um, which includes um, big states like uh, Canada, for example, Japan um, and uh, Russia also. Um, in between is a bit um, the EU, which is struggling between um, both groups, always trying to mediate between them. And the division um, between those two groups is mainly about um, the commitments um, one should have on a climate change agreement. So the G77 and the other groups um, would argue um, that the uh, reduction targets do only apply uh, to developed countries. They should be binding and they should include a differentiation between the developed countries and the developing countries. Um, on the other hand, the US argues that there should be commitments for all countries, including developing and developed countries. The target should be flexible, so every state should be able um, to give um, itself um, reduction targets, and they should be based on uh, the principle of equality, so there is no differentiation between um, the states. Okay, right now we know the three um, dominant conflicts and we know that the third one is the most important one. And we can now ask what will happen in Paris then this year in the um, international climate change negotiations. And therefore I want to apply um, an international relations perspective and there are two big international relations uh, theories which are important and which we want to use uh, in the following. The first perspective is um, realism and realism is a theoretical approach based on the assumption that there is anarchy in the international system. So that means politics is always a struggle for power. So every nation in the international system is striving uh, for power and wants to have more power than the other states. The actors are then logically states, so that means states only. So we are not interested, for example, in NGOs or IGOs. And we also consider states as black boxes. So we are not interested of what is going on in the states. We are only uh, interested what is going on between the different states. Key variables in explaining the behavior of those states is their military and economic power. So we can easily judge that China, because of its military and economic power, is more influential than, for example, Luxembourg. So that would be a very easy uh, judgment if we just count, um, for example, the soldiers or if we just count um, the growth uh, domestic pro, um, product. Um, the aim of the states is to have relative gains. So on the contrary, that would mean absolute gains. So that means um, that China is not only interesting in what it gets itself as a gain, it is also interested in what the others get. So for example, if, the China, if China would have higher um, emission reduction targets than the US, that would mean they don't have um, relative gains or relative losses. So we always have to keep that in mind when uh, taking a realistic perspective. So, um, overall this means that the cooperation, as you uh, maybe would have guessed, is very unlikely between the states and only possible if the relative gains for everybody um, is given. So, um, climate change by realism is considered as kind of a low politics, so uh, states are not very interested in the topic of climate change. For example, um, military or economic um, issues are of high importance for states, climate change is not. The second perspective uh, we have in international relations is constructivism. Constructivism is based on the assumption that there's no clear meaning and there's no objective um, meaning in the world. So um, the perception of the world is always based on social, social constructions of the world we have. And um, what something means, so for example, what military power means, what economic means, is always 
um, based on the recognition of that material and also of ideational um, factors. Actors in constructivism are um, individuals and collectives. So that is totally different to what we have in realism. So we would also look at uh, NGOs, for example, like Greenpeace. We would look at uh, IGOs, uh, the UN, for example. So that is really of interest for constructivism and is totally ne neglected um, by realism. Um, opposite to realism, key variables um, in constructivism are the construction of identity and interests. That means that interests are never fixed, so they are always um, depending on, um, on circumstances. For example, um, interests in 1990 could be totally different for the US than they are right now. So um, we have to, to keep that in mind. Overall cooperation, um, if we take all these um, assumptions and variables, is more likely and possible in constructivism than in realism but only if they are like-minded uh, states or, uh, for example, leaders uh, which have the same perception of the problems and which do also share common norms, for example, uh, the reduction of emission targets. Okay, right now we have these two perspectives and what I want to do now is apply them to the different states and different important states we have in the climate change negotiations. And for sure, the most important state, uh, the most important state is um, the United States. Um, and if we look at the United States um, and its current position from realism, we would say, um, first of all, that the influence in the climate change negotiations for the US is very high because it's one of the major emitters. So it would have, we would say that it has um, a lot of power capabilities. On the other hand, we would say that interest in, policy, in the policy area of climate change is very low. If you remember, um, this is low politics for the US. Um, the costs uh, for reduction uh, in the United States are comparably high. So they are much higher than, for example, in the European Union. So um, we can conclude that the cooperation um, for the US on the climate change change negotiations is very unlikely and only possible if other major emitters um, comply. So then the relative gains would be relatively high. Um, from a constructivist uh, perspective, we would look um, first of all at Obama, who is very um, supportive for climate change action and acknowledges that there's a need for emission reductions. Keep in mind um, the agreement we recently had uh, between the US and China. Um, also, or contrary, could I even say contrary, um, Obama says that uh, developing countries also have to pay their dues in the climate negotiations, so um, reduction targets should apply to all the states. Um, the US would also say that there should be a common responsibility, so no differentiation like we have in the principle of common but differentiated um, responsibilities. Um, if we see the recent developments, we could also uh, observe that the public awareness for climate change um, has increased. It is not really as high as it is in the Europe European Union, for example, but it's much higher than it was five or ten years ago. Um, still, we have this ideological debate about the signs, which is mainly between the Republicans who say that the signs um, uh, is, not, um, is not confident enough um, to take action versus Democrats who believe um, that the climate change problem is real and based on a consensus of science. Um, also, we have the lobbyist groups uh, in the United States which try to influence um, Obama and try to influence the politics um, that they don't come um, to an agreement, to a strong agreement. And the next state we are flying to is Brazil and Brazil um, from a realist perspective um, has increased power capabilities uh, through the last year. It is now the fourth largest emitter and is one emerging economy and um, still uh, growing so its influence has really increased throughout the last um, decades. The costs for reductions um, in Brazil are comparably low to the other states um, due to the um, deforestation um, we had uh, in Brazil uh, during the last years. So we could argue that the relative uh, gains for Brazil are um, higher than they are, um, for example, for the US. 
um, from a construct uh, perspective, um, we could say that the vulnerability to climate change and its effects is very high in Brazil. It suffers a lot, uh, for example, from droughts, from flooding, so they are highly affected from climate change. Um, Brazil itself perceives um, to be an advocate uh, for developing countries and um, also, but also acknowledges the responsibility for um, developing countries to take action. They are kind of in between um, the two strict positions of who's responsible um, for the climate change problem. Um, they would also say that fairness in climate change should be based on the capacity, not on the responsibility. So those who have the cap uh, capacity and the economic, for example, the monetary um, capacity to act should act and uh, there should be no divide if that is um, developing or developed countries. Um, next we have um, the IOSA states, which um, from a realist perspective um, have, as you might have judged, a low uh, economic power, so they don't um, have much influence in the negotiations. They are a low emitter um, so it is not really necessary to include them into uh, any agreement. What they do um, uh, is they bandwagoning, so that means they are really trying um, to cooperate with one bigger country which has the same interests. And that is, uh, in the case of climate change, mainly the EU, who is also voting um, to have a strong agreement, so they are often um, sitting together uh, for the EU, taking a similar position uh, and therefore trying to increase um, their influence. The gains for the OSIS um, group is um, very high if there would be an international agreement because um, for the OSIS it's just a question uh, of survival. Um, from constructivism, we would say that um, the OSIS um, perceive themselves kind of a victim of climate change uh, that contributes to their to uh, their identity, so they often state during the negotiations um, that uh, a negotiation is crucial and they blame the other um, countries being responsible for, uh, for it. So um, it really is an existential uh, threat um, caused by climate change for the OSIS. And this is why it often states that there is historic, that there is historic responsibility of developing countries to take the lead um, in a climate change agreement. Also, um, there's a moral obligation for all the parties, so not only for, developing, uh, for developed countries, but also for developing countries, and that this fairness so should be um, based on capacity. So that means also China, India uh, and Brazil should take action in climate change because they have the economic um, capacity to do so. Um, they use blaming and shaming, or you can call it moral leadership, um, as a mechanism um, to support uh, this idea of a strong uh, climate change agreement. Next we have um, China, and China, um, similar to the, U to the US, has a high economic um, capability. It's uh, one of the major emitters, so that means that the gains from um, a corporation could be very small because the costs for reduction in China are comparably high, so that means they have to invest a lot of money to really um, decrease the amount um, of emissions in their country. Um, we could also conclude that China only would um, support an agreement if the US and the EU take also similar burdens, so that uh, the relative gains and that there's inequality between um, the relative gains. Um, from constructivism, China and perceives itself still as a developing country. It is a member of the G77, so that is really a part of their identity. They really believe that they are, um, that they are still a developing country and are not in the position um, to take reduction targets. They also um, argue that the developing countries have the historic responsibility to act. For example, the US and the European Union who caused um, uh, most of the um, historic um, emissions. So they really um, believe that the common but differentiated responsibility should be in um, a climate change agreement uh, in Paris. So it should not be, um, should not be um, neglected. Fairness then is based um, on historic responsibility and not on the capacity. Even if China has the capacity, it is not um, obliged uh, 
um, to take um, any action because the historic responsibility is still um, with uh, the developed countries. That is often um, announced in the, in the right to grow, so that means China still needs economic development and still um, can grow throughout the next years um, and not be, um, not be harmed by any reduction targets. On the other hand, China um, throughout the last um, years um, suffers from the rising pressure of the population. So the population um, really is not uh, satisfied um, with, all the, um, with all the problems caused, uh, for example, by the pollution or caused by traffic and really um, wants to have a, a change there. And that means that um, the people are also suffering from the climate change um, effects which occur throughout um, the last uh, years. Last but not least, we have um, the European Union. From a realist perspective, we could say that the power capabilities of the European Union is medium because um, throughout the last years it uh, faced an economic decline because of the, of the economic crisis that occurred in 2008 and also um, in 2011. Um, also, it is only a medium emitter, so um, it, is, um, not so, um, it is not really needed anymore to include them into a climate change agreement. It is more important to have agreement between um, the really big emitters, China, India and um, the US. Uh, the costs for reduction of emissions are between medium and low, so they are much lower than they are um, in China and um, in the US. So that means the relative gains for the European Union, if there is any agreement, um, would be higher than in the US and in China, but only if um, the US and China would take uh, similar targets. From constructivism, we would say that the European Union uh, perceives itself as kind of a norm entrepreneur. Um, that means um, it really acknowledges um, the norms of emission reduction and uh, the common but differentiated um, responsibility. It also um, acknowledges um, the historic responsibility it has uh, for uh, causing um, the emissions um, throughout, um, uh, yeah, throughout the last, um, the last um, decades. Um, it wants to be a leader, so it wants to take leadership and it also wants to take um, help us interest for the OSIS, as I've, I've stated before um, when I mentioned this um, bandwagoning uh, problem. Um, in addition, from the beginning on, the awareness in the population, in the, in the European population, for the climate change problem was um, very high and the media um, very um, much received um, the problem of uh, climate change um, on from the beginning. So that was really um, a big topic and still is a big topic um, in the European Union. So if we've looked at all these states and their position and what we can expect, what do the, um, the theories offer um, for the climate change agreement? What do they think um, is a climate change agreement possible? Um, realism clearly would state that there will be no uh, climate change agreement in Paris because uh, there's much pain or gain. That means the costs for most of the countries, uh, including China and the US, are really, really high and the gain um, is not very high because there's only gain for the European Union and there's only gain for the OSIS, but they have a small influence on the climate change negotiations. Um, constructivism would be a bit more um, optimistic, but would also say that the cooperation is unlikely because what we don't see um, if we compare all this position is common norms, for example, like a norm for emission reduction, a norm for a common but differentiated responsibility. Um, we don't have that at the moment. We have, we have, um, small, uh, we have some states which are um, try to, to um, try to create a common norm on the international level, but they have not been successful yet. And also we have no common perception of who really is responsible for the climate change problem and also who should be um, in charge to take um, reduction targets or not. Yeah, I hope I've given you um, a first overview about what international relations um, can 
provide in explaining um, the international climate change negotiations and why it is um, so complicated. And I hope that you will all uh, be watching the climate change negotiations and have a better understanding of why um, cooperating between or cooperation between states is often so complicated. Thank you.